please click on that Q&A tab and you can post your questions at any given point in time during the course of, of, of this discussion. The next important tab is the chat tab. If there are any questions, if there are any messages that you want to send to the panelist or to, to the host, then please click on the chat tab, type in your message and send it across. Let's do a quick check. I can already see uh, Shrikanth who, who wishes us good afternoon from IOCL. I al already see Atanu Mukherjee wishing us good afternoon. Uh, Santanu also says hello, hello Santanu. So this is how you use the chat tab. May I request one of you to please post a question in the Q&A tab by just saying a quick hi so that we are all very clear on how to use the Q&A tab. Perfect. Mr. Murthy and Mr. Anand have already posted along with Praveen. So yes, Q&A tab is also great. Lovely. So let me hand over to, to Samriddhi who will run the show for us today. Samriddhi, over to you. Thank you, Nilesh. A very, very good afternoon to all of you. In fact, indeed, a very warm uh, afternoon we have on this Corona day. So uh, once again, welcome to all to today's webinar on future of work in the new normal. Uh, this is uh, this is uh, organized by Scope and Association with Deloitte. And this is our fifth webinar in the series. And we acknowledge the overwhelming response that we have received from all our participants and all our PSE fraternity members Thank you all for supporting us in all our innovative endeavors. This is indeed a very timely seminar today, a webinar today, that we are actually talking about a new normal in the work forms. It is not only we have to be prepared for a new work order, but we also have to be prepared for acceptance of the new work order. So before we proceed, I would just like to introduce to our panelists we have uh, Mr. Atul Sopti, Director General Scope. Who, uh, we also have from the PSD fraternity and uh, executive board member, Mr. Sunil Kumar, Director HR and EB from MTNL. We are from Deloitte, we have Nilesh who will be helping me co-host the show. We have Mr. Ankur Valunkar, who is partner Deloitte, and Mr. Pratik and Mehra Mehta, who, uh, who is again partner Deloitte in the human resource capital. Today's webinar will be addressing the significance that CPSCs have in the economy today and the biggest responsibility for the key employer in the present time is to be acceptable to the new uh, work order that we are looking at. So to help us understand today, we have brought to you a wide range of panelists. Starting with Mr. Atul Stopi, who is Director General Scope. Sir was a CMD BHEL and he brings us brings with him a vast experience of HR and many new initiatives that he introduced in BHEL. His innovative policies in BHEL has made the organization rise over and over above. And now in scope, it was his initiative to give work from home a new dimension and to introduce it for the employees and hence Today, our work from home policy is very effective and running very efficiently. Thank you, sir. I also have the pleasure of introducing Mr. Sunil Kumar, who is Director HR and EB, one of the leading telecom providers of the country, MTNL. So, who also had the additional charge of CMD, CMD MTNL. With his vast experience over spanning over years of, uh, uh, years of experience in public sector, Sir has led many human resource and uh, other operative uh, uh, projects in the organization very successfully. And he would be helping us to summarize the entire event and also to give a pragmatic, uh, pragmatic, uh, 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 pragmatic angle to the entire human resource uh, work order today. Please join me to welcome our knowledge partners from Deloitte, Mr. Al Ankur Balunkar, who is part of Deloitte. Ankur leads the workforce transformation service line of Deloitte and has over two decades of rich experience in the field of HR and has benefited many companies in forming operating models, organization design, talent strategies, digital HR transformation, etc. Of late, Ankur has been advising global organizations to address the future of work needs. Welcome, Ankur, to our webinar today. We also have with us Mr. Pratik and Mehta, who is part of Human Resource Capital of Deloitte. He works with the business leaders to drive business performance through intervention in areas of leadership, development, 
planning solutions and organization transformation. He provides simplest solution to the most complex human resource problem of any client, including PSEs and government sector. His latest body of work includes advising clients on building a digital workforce and capitalizing through digital transformation. With this, we I have introduced the entire panel with me uh, with us here today, a blend of consultancy and rich experience in the public sector fraternity. Before I uh, before I uh, I request uh, our panelists to actually our, our knowledge partners to start the uh, webinar technically, I would request Director General Scope to kindly address the participants with us. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Smriti. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome all of you for this fifth webinar as part of our SCOPE webinar series 2020. And topic, as Smriti has already mentioned, is very interesting. Future of work in the new normal. At the outset, I'd like to share with all the participants that as part of our public sector day celebration the scope today is releasing the special issue of its monthly magazine gladio scope this issue covers is a special issue and it covers the journey of psc's in socio economic development of the country and an exemplary work which is being done today by the psc's in supplementing the efforts of the government in combating the COVID-19. We have received excellent inputs from PSCs, experts, academicians, which will form an interesting deed. The SCOPE team, which has worked tirelessly to deliver this issue in time, despite the ongoing lockdown, will be separately sharing with you the e-version of this issue. And I'm sure that you will find this reading very interesting. Ladies and gentlemen, coming to the webinar, after conceiving conceptualization and concretizing this idea of holding the webinar for the capacity building of the public sector enterprise fraternity in a short span of around three weeks time, we have been organized, able to organize fifth, five seminars, five webinars and uh, this have uh, we had the panelist national and international panelist and thank you for the overwhelming support which has been given by all the public sector enterprise fraternity and the others associated with the pscs the fifth seminar which we are holding today is on a very interesting topic which i mentioned which is the future of work in the in the new normal and it becomes very relevant also because in the present time the new work form which has been set in, none of us had imagined, I think before 25th of March, nobody thought that this kind of work form would be there, especially in the public sectors. Today webinar, a lot of interest has generated because the topic is so interesting. Initially, we were thinking when we started the webinar, we thought we'd have around 100 participants, 200 participants or so. But today I am pleased to share with you that already I think more than 508 have joined, 508 already joined, and many more are still joining. That puts a lot of pressure on the panelists, eminent panelists, Ankur and Pratik, because expectations are very high. And the, both of them have had a very vast experience. I'm sure that all of us will discuss among ourselves. And it's a new things for the public sector fraternity also, and we'll come up with the solutions, challenges, debate among ourselves, and uh, if required, we will have a second or third webinar in this series on this particular topic itself, maybe on the performance management system, maybe how to engage the employees, may, maybe on the emotional engagements, etc., depending on the feedback we get from you. Ladies and gentlemen, work from home or virtual uh, offices is the new normal. Not only the public sector, it started with the private sector multinational, but now it has become during the COVID period a normal thing in the public sector enterprises, central government offices, ministries, 
in fact for the first time i feel in fact government themselves will pushing for this concept of work from home i would like to draw your attention to the honorable prime minister statement which he made while talking to some of the youngsters and the professionals that home is going to be the hope in today's world during this period home is the new office and the internet has become the meeting room hence it would not be understatement to mention that covid has given us negatives are there but certain opportunities are there that we all of us learning this new concepts new work forms and which definitely which will give us not only opportunities which is also going to give us lot of challenges also i am sure those challenges would we will also be covering it challenges could be for example the timing the work life balance because when you work from home it gives that feeling is there that 24 hours you have to work there the emotional feeling meeting each other feeling but those points will also be discussed during the uh, during the presentation as well as question answer but i feel this is the time when public sector needs to prepare itself and understand the requirement so that it will make the work from home a success without compromising on the productivity of the individual employees as well as the employer we are ready for it and uh, it would require in involvement of everybody and maybe change in the mindset maybe change in the policies that's the reason that public we scope started this particular uh, webinar as mentioned by samiti we also have mr sunil kumar who is the director on the board of mtnl and who also held the charge of the chairman and managing director of mtnl which is uh, in fact the key telecom telecom operator in our country and we will gain from his experience and who will guide us through the pragmatism of the virtual office complex uh, virtual office uh, spaces also with such a rich faculty which we have i request all of you take best use of it and please don't hesitate to ask any questions which possible we'll try to respond today depending upon the time or offline also replies can be given thank you thank you very much and once again welcome to all of you happy learning to you and enjoy the webinar thank you thank you sir thanks for very encouraging words and as sir mentioned cpscs have a very very significant role to play in today's virtual office space not only they have to adapt to the new working environment but also be flexible as well as effective now for this we have our esteemed panelists with us ankur balunkar and pratik mehta from deloitte to guide us through our webinar and to answer all your possible queries as dg so mentioned we would be we would try all our, our our level best to actually take the questions here itself but in case if there are any important questions which are left unanswered please feel free to contact scope at the available email ids and we will get in touch with deloitte and respond to them as fast as possible with this i request all of you to be as interactive as possible however please avoid lengthy questions and cross questioning uh, cross questioning because this would uh, prevent other uh, questions to be taken up with the limited time we have so over to the panelists now the webinar is technically open nilesh over to you thank you and uh, ankur and pratik before you step in there is a very interesting question that i wanted to answer which mr pravin kumar has asked he is asking what is the significance of number 10 appearing in the backdrop of the next speakers this uh, number 10 is uh, is the 10 million csr target that uh, that uh, deloitte has taken for upliftment of girl child in india so that's our commitment to society and that's what uh, we feel very proud of ankur and pratik over to you Okay. Thank you, uh, Nilesh. Um, can we uh, and can we have the presentation, please? So while the presentation comes up, um, I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity um, to to present to you. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to make it interesting. We're going to start with some numbers for you, um, and uh, let's see if you are able to to guess what this is. Um, what this means is um since the time of the lockdown there have been 3 billion minutes uh, of voice based meetings conducted on collaboration tools there have been 
petabytes of data consumed in the first week of the lockdown. And then there has been three X, three times the growth of LinkedIn learning usage uh, since the beginning of this lockdown. Very interesting numbers here. Um, what it indicates is, is obviously the fact that there has been a significant adoption of technology. Uh, there has been a significant adoption of new ways of working. And it's a, you know, it's a good platform for us to build on as we proceed in this session. So why don't we, um, let's go next. Let's, uh, let's look at what really future of work means. It's a, it's a, lo a lot, future of work, so to speak, has been discussed a lot. There's a lot of lip service paid to this, uh, to this subject. There are many interpretations. M many of the interpretations are right. Um, and many of the interpretations have many different meanings as well. But here's how we look at future of work. Um, and what's, uh, what's pertinent to today is, is the fact that, you know, whether you, uh, whether you approach it from a workforce angle or whether you approach it from an organization angle, uh, there, is, uh, there is something in it which we need to look at very seriously going forward. So here's what, uh, here's what we look, you know, here's our lens of future of work, which is it starts with what work needs to be done. And in that, if you look at the sub context, it's about what work actually needs to be done by um, uh, by being there. Uh, you know what what specific outcomes do you need to drive uh, as part of the work, and and how do you actually uh, optimize it to the highest level using technology, using automation, and off late obviously other techniques such as machine learning and AI or in, in the manufacturing field, uh, things like 3D printing, right? So one dimension is what work needs to be done. Um, in, in the virtualization context, it's also about what, works, what, what work needs to be done at the workplace. And we'll come to that in just a little bit. Um, the second angle to this is the workforce. What workforce do we need now that we have redesigned work. Let's assume that we redesign what we need to do in the context of our business, in the context of what's going on around us, the changing scenario, the changing customer needs, and how the market is going to evolve going forward. If you have redesigned work, if to perform that work, what what kind of a workforce do we need? Remember, it's, uh, it's your usual on-role employees, your off-role employees, the gig workers, as you call it, it's also machines and sometimes ecosystems, uh, which would also perhaps contain workforce segments from your traditional competitors. Uh, is there a way for us to share workforce where you have talent shortage is a big question on the table for us. And then the third dimension, which the augments both the previous dimension is the workplace. In today's context, this is one of the most important, which is where does the work need to be done? And, and if you apply a virtualization lens to that, I would start with the question, why can't I do this work virtually? Uh, whether it is about, let's take as an example, valve maintenance in, in refineries, uh, is there something that you can do to actually track and monitor that both from a predictive maintenance perspective, but also use robotics for actual tasks where some of the work can be done remotely? You know, so there are a lot of these questions on the table in front of us. Some of it is very much possible. Some of it is achievable in the short term. Some of it, it, it is achievable in the long term. If you look at the, the diagram in the center, the green, um, the green triangle, if you will, represents perhaps where you could go in, across those axes that we have outlined, which is automation level, talent category, and physical proximity where does the work need to be done is physical physical proximity and and you will see that you know in the future a lot of that can be done or should be done virtually right so this sets us up very well for uh, for everything that we have learned based on our study interestingly enough we did the study on future of work both in india as well as uh, in, in many countries globally and the data that we have found is very consistent which is uh, it does break down into these three dimensions. What's the work? What's the workforce that you need? And what's what does the new workplace look like? Right. 
So on the background of this, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand it over to my colleague Pratik to talk to us about uh, some specific learnings that we have got from our study. Okay. Pratik, over to you. Thanks. Thanks for that, Ankur. Uh, can you move to the next slide? So, uh, you know, before we get down to the specific learnings, uh, one of the very interesting things uh, Mr. Sopti said at the start of this conversation was that uh, our, you know, Honorable Prime Minister had quite, you know, aptly put it that, uh, that, uh, that, our, uh, that our home is the new office and uh, data is the new meeting room. Now, if you look at it, for that to actually hold true, the rate of adoption of technology has to significantly increase, right? And uh, historically, you you have a range of technology players creating, you know, various uh, various you know apps, various you know, softwares. But if you see the rate of uh, if you see the rate of adoption of these new you know, technologies, um, you will see that uh, individuals such as you and myself have been doing that the fastest. After that, you have businesses which have you know, uh, which have said that all right, you know, we have a lot of people who are using, let's say, Skype casually. So why don't we have you know Skype for business for ourselves? So you have business who are going to follow suit in that you know choice and say, because we have a large large percentage of our employees using a particular technology, let us also adopt it. And then you will also have you know public policy being being you know formed around it, and you will have government institutions. Who will say that um, you know? Given that there is a large-scale adoption of this technology, both among people as well as businesses at large, let's have some policy guidelines around this, and 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 you know, let us as government also create some sort of a governance mechanism around this. But that was prior to the COVID period. Once COVID happened, and once all of us had to start moving into our homes and 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 you know, really working from our homes day in and day out, uh, technology adoption. Took a dramatic, uh, you know, up upturn. We as individuals started to adopt newer technologies. Our businesses started to make significant uh, investments faster and faster into technology, as well as many of our colleagues across the CPSCs also started to say that, hey, look, are there new, you know, technologies which we can adopt or so on, right? So if so, if you look at the graph in you know front of me, the solid line represents what has been. The rate of change and the rate of uh, rate of you know adoption vis-a-vis -vis technology. But if you look at it from a COVID lens perspective, you will actually see that that uh, that you know speed has only dramatically increased over this period of time, and that's one one uh, one big finding which has actually come up. And so we did uh, and you know so we did a little bit of a deep dive and and um, and in India we spoke to uh, you know we spoke to approximately 45 to 50 business leaders and we asked them that. Why is there a, such a dramatic shift in adoption? And they came up with four reasons. And you know, reason number one was that look, uh, we we uh, we had a fairly traditional mindset prior to this. It was very important for us to meet face to face and have these conversations. But now that can no longer happen. It's uh, it's a significant shift for us, right? They also said that look, if we don't uh, if we don't adopt to these you know, technology changes. Uh, our businesses are going to suffer. We're going to literally have businesses coming to a grinding halt, and we therefore need to adopt. The third was um, we had a lot of business leaders who said that uh, we have been, you know, uh, shying away from taking certain steps towards uh, towards you know automation in the past, but given uh, given where we are right now, we are forced to do them, right? And the fourth part was uh, many business leaders also said that. Uh, the COVID-19 situation provides an opportunity for us to fundamentally relook at our business model itself and the way our uh, our workforce sits within our organizations. Very recently, the CEO of you know, TCS made a uh, made a statement in public saying that by you know 2025, he really expects 75% of his workforce to be uh, to be working out of home. And therefore, this is leading to an emergence of a you know hybrid work, uh, workplace model as well. Right now, on the back of all of this, and we said that uh, what are some of the statistical findings which have really emerged from this study which we conducted uh, over the last you know three uh, three odd weeks? So, uh, Nirish, if you can move to the next slide, let us let us you know walk you through them. Um, 
The study was conducted in two parts. We had detailed conversations with approximately 45 to 50 business leaders. And they were across a range of organizations. Many of them were from, let's say, uh, engineering companies, um, IT, ITES, technology, professional services, government, and so on. So we took all of their findings and we you know, consolidated that. And, um, and these individuals also filled out a fairly detailed survey on the basis of which we could you know, uh, extrapolate certain insights. So finding number one, and if you can come to the next slide. Uh, Nilesh, if you can come to the first learning. Yeah. So the first finding which we've uh, which we've seen really is um, it goes without saying, work has been disrupted dramatically since the lockdown has begun, right? And there have been various reasons why this work has been uh, you know disrupted. If you look at it from a you know heavy manufacturing perspective. Um, the physical assets which uh, to which most organizations are attached to they are no longer uh, they're no longer accessible at this particular point in time it basically means your production lines have shut down you can no longer uh, you know <clears throat> you can no longer have huge you know, gatherings of people at these places so obviously you know manufacturing has come to a grinding halt but you know apart from that there have also been disruptions due to the fact that um, the enabling it infrastructure is currently lacking in a number of organizations. In fact, you know, 55% of the organizations who we spoke to actually were were, uh, were you know, struggling to a large extent because their own own you know IT systems could not actually support them. And the problems were fairly basic in nature. So we heard people talk about problems such as the there, uh, there weren't sufficient number of you know VPN uh, VPN nodes for uh, for our employees to connect to the servers. Uh, many of our employees don't have you know, laptops. Many of them don't have you know, data cards. If they do have data cards, internet bandwidth is not there. Um, in some cases, the current living, uh, living situation of the particular uh, individual is not, uh, is not entirely supportive for them to work, uh, you know, work from home. In, in you know, many cases, concerns are around you know, confidentiality of data and so on. And therefore, um, if, uh, if you look at the word cloud in the center, the number of challenges which have come, you know, which have come at the forefront to, uh, to you know, re, uh, to, you know, really prevent the workforce from actually being, you know, meaningfully deployed, is is you know quite uh, is you know, quite vast. Having said that, it is also commendable that in this that you know in this period of time, there has been an overwhelming response from the workforce across sectors, across industries, uh, private or you know public sector around ensuring that there is minimal disruption to the flow of work. Um, employees have made personal investments. Employees have uh, gone you know, above and beyond the call of duty to make sure that they are able to sort of deliver on the business promise. Um, oftentimes, this has also meant taking, you know, uh, you know uh, oftentimes this has meant you know, purchasing a data card, using your own own, uh, own funds, purchasing laptops, purchasing you know, microphone equipment and so on. But Net, net the point being that um, a lot of people felt that you know workforce productivity might actually drop. But on the other hand, we've seen that the workforce themselves have come forward and said that look, uh, we recognize the crisis, but we want to do everything that is you know humanly possible to make sure that we are able to deliver on the business promise. And you know that that we found to be extremely you know heartening in this particular uh, you know, point in time. Right. So that was you know, learning number one. Uh, coming to learning number two, yeah, Nilesh, can we come to learning number two? Yeah, so this was, to... yes, possibly, yeah. So you know, this was this was uh, this was a real uh, this was a real surprise to you know many of us. You would have expected that during this period of time, many organizations would have made investments in the purchase of licenses of you know, collaboration tools. As it turns out, 75% um, of the business leaders whom we spoke to said that their organizations actually already have invested prior to the COVID period in the purchase of some, some of the other type of a collaboration tool. Right? Um, however, it's only because of COVID-19 
that the adoption of these particular platforms has actually increased. I was working some while back for a fairly large public sector organization, and I realized that all of them actually have Skype on their machines. Um, having said that, the adoption of Skype was actually not, not that much. Because of COVID-19, majority of their workforce has actually moved over to Skype because of that. And now that is that is you know, significantly interesting because at one level, you would think that um, did, you know, companies have to spend excessively on the purchase of collaboration tools, but it turns out actually no. What, what, what they really did have to do was ensure the adoption and the usage of, of you know, these types of uh, tools. Primarily what we noticed was there were four tools which were used across, um, um, across various industries. Tool number one was Zoom, and Zoom has gained a tremendous amount of popularity all across the world. In fact, um, there's a very interesting uh, you know, uh, insight which I want to share with you. If you look at the share price of Zoom prior to the COVID period and post the COVID period, it's actually increased astronomically. We saw the rest of the stock market, which has actually collapsed, right? So the second most important tool people are using is, uh, is you know, Microsoft Teams. Um, and the benefit of that is because uh, most of the organizations have a Office 365 license. Microsoft Teams comes, you know, along uh, along with it. The third, uh, the third tool which has been very widely used is you know, WebEx, um, to a large extent, also because of its security features. Skype continues to remain a strong uh, a strong player within the you know, collaboration space. And finally, you have a range of other smaller uh, smaller tools across uh, which are being used across the world. Now, what has happened is that because of the use of these collaboration tools and because people are working from home, certain interesting behaviors have started to emerge. And the most important of these behaviors is collaboration itself. Uh, earlier, people used to work in their own silos and departments and functions and so on. But what has uh, increasingly started you know, happening is that people have realized it's much faster to work together as a team by, by you know, coming together on a platform such as Zoom or MS Teams or so on, and, and to actually work, work you know, together. And that has led to sort of breaking down the entire silos and the um, and, you know, barriers to collaboration. In fact, you will, you will see slightly later on in this presentation, uh, but you know, 60% of, of you know, business leaders believe that, um, that they've, um, that they want to revisit the construct of their entire organization structure itself, largely because of the fact that collaboration has increased so much more, and and you know uh, and you know people are working in teams rather than working in the traditional department and function structure. Um, what has also happened is uh, the overall speed of decision making has also increased significantly during this time, um, and the. And you know, one of the underlying reasons people said uh, said said that this happened was because um, because people are doing virtual meetings. They want to start these meetings with a very well defined agenda and you know a set of outcomes. We saw we a general uh, general face to face conversation, um, and this has led to a significant improvement in the uh, in the you know, overall speed of decision making. And finally, at a institutional customer level. Um, a lot of business leaders felt that um, because they are able to connect much, much you know, faster now, and they no longer need to meet someone in person, but they can actually do a VC with them. They've been able to connect at a much more deeper level and, and you know, far more frequently with their customers. We saw we back in the day when they when uh, when they had to navigate through you know going to office first and then you know commuting to the customer and then you know coming back and so on. So the speed of communication and the manner of communication also seems to have improved in this period of time, and that and you know that uh, that came out as a resounding finding across the various you know business leaders we spoke to. You know, coming to um, coming to a learning number three. Yeah, and this is all about uh, you know productivity. I think one of the um, one of the burning platform questions during this entire code period and in so many news articles around this, where uh, some people have said uh, employee productivity has dropped, others have said no, it's actually increased. 
Um, a third lot of people have said, well, people are working much longer hours, but the real output is significantly lower. And so, you know, there's been a fair bit of debate around the entire concept of your know, productivity. <clears throat> so we decided to ask the business leaders a straight up question. Um, define you know, productivity for us and what has been the impact of COVID because of this. And the answers were extremely interesting. And you know, there was there was a dichotomy of sorts. Business leaders said that from an overall revenue generation perspective, um, productivity had indeed decreased. Approximately 99% of the companies are impacted by you know, productivity drop. And you know, um, and, and that's primarily because you know, revenues have dropped, right? So if you look at the green, uh, the green bars on your left hand side, it will show you that um, really there are, there are barely a you know, hand, uh, hand, handful of companies who would have said that this, this you know, period from a business standpoint has been you know, beneficial for them. Having said that, individual productivity in this period of time has actually increased a little bit. If you look at the white uh, white bars out here, you would see that 60% of uh, employees feel that they've been a lot more productive in the way they're able to deliver their work in this uh, in this uh, in this period of time. A few of the reasons which were you know, cited at this point was um, that they don't have to commute to work anymore. They no longer have to uh, attend unnecessary meetings. They're able to work without, you know, with you know, minimal disruptions. Oftentimes, um, they're able to connect with clients and customers faster and so on. And therefore, in general, they felt that their productivity had indeed increased. Now, we, we actually did a little bit of a drill down to understand, are there particular sets of employees whose you know, productivity has increased and, and you know, vice versa? So as it turns out, um, enabling functions such as you know business operations, IT, HR, and so on, have actually had to put in a lot of additional effort during this period of time to ensure business continuity. And therefore, they are working in empowered teams, and they are working significantly longer uh, longer hours, and that has led to uh, an overall improvement of the productivity numbers. Also, individuals who are um, uh, who are doing uh, independent work or they're focused on you know more you know, creative areas or they're focused on you know, cognitive areas of work they too have seen a rise of productivity including people who are scientists and researchers and so on right where productivity seems to have suffered from an individual perspective is at you know legacy organizations and those are your uh, you know traditional classical industries where, where there has been to some extent uh, a bit of a mindset block towards towards taking uh, uh, towards you know uh, towards you know adopting technology towards uh, towards adopting a work from home as a concept, and that's where we are seeing uh, you know productivity drops coming. Down. A second interesting insight around this whole productivity angle is that um, business leaders have also started to recognize this to some extent. And therefore, they are putting in place formal work from home policies as well, which they wish to implement not only during this current lockdown period, but they also want to extend it beyond the lockdown period into the recovery and the thrive phases of our economy and say that, look, can this be a long term sustainable uh, way of working as well? So these were some of the interesting productivity led insights which you know, came out from the study. Coming to, uh, coming to learning number four. Um, during this period of time, what, what we've noticed is uh, organizations and senior management in particular has been leading from the heart. And what that means is that they've placed an inordinate amount of focus and a concern towards uh, employee wellness and, uh, and you know, well, well, uh, well-being at this time. Now, wellness is in two parts. You have, you know, physical well-being and that's to check that, hey, um, have you been impacted because of COVID or not? <clears throat> but organizations have also started to realize that this period is also a period of significant emotional and you know, psychological strain, not only for the employee, but also their family and their loved ones and so on. And we realized that um, 
85% of organizations in Docker have put in place some form of mechanism to track uh, to track employee wellness. Um, in fact, more than 70% of the organizations whom we spoke to, they've, they've you know, uh, they're actually conducting very regular uh, town halls, pulse surveys, and uh, checking conversations with their employees to you know um, to you know test for uh, you know wellness. And um, you um, nearly 70% of them have also set up a dedicated counseling service and a counseling helpline as well to uh, to make sure that employees mental health is is not impacted during this period of time the second interesting part around uh, um, around wellness that we noticed and primarily around staying you know connected and uh, engaged with the employees was um, there is a fair bit of um, there's a fair bit of you know high touch engagement which has actually started during this lockdown period. What this means is people are using mediums such as Zoom and you know, WebEx and, and Skype and so on to actually have informal check-ins. And you know, ladies and gentlemen, I would urge you to think about it from this way. When, when, when you know, we are in our office space, we do take breaks. We meet around the water cooler, or we uh, or we meet near the coffee machine, or we will have lunch, uh, lunch or a you know snack together, right? In this environment, it's not possible, and therefore, team leaders and managers and leaders are creating these moments of uh, high touch engagements, where they're inviting people just to have a social conversation over a video conference and say that let's have a cup of tea together, or let's you know enjoy lunch together and have a conversation. Let's do it over, you know. Uh, let's do it over, you know, VC, right? So that that uh, that really came out as a very strong uh, uh, strong insight across the many many leaders we spoke to. Uh, finally, the third part, and and you know, this is something which I must share, is uh, employees and organizations in general have been using this opportunity to really focus on future skill uh, skill building. There is a statistic that there has been a 300%, and I uh, and I know repeat there is a 300% increase in you know learning consumption during this entire COVID period. So pre-COVID, people were working, but they really didn't have time to focus on skill building. In in uh, in this COVID period, people are saying that look, this is not a vacation or a holiday, but I'm going to take this as an opportunity to upskill myself, and. There are companies like LinkedIn Learning and various other learning portals which have seen a dramatic increase in the consumption of you know, learning skills. In fact, uh, many public sector organizations who I work with have actually started using mediums such as Zoom and WebEx and so on to, to make sure that they're able to provide skill-based training to large, uh, large majority of their organizations. Uh, Ankur and I are you know, working with one one such very large public sector organization, where we've seen nearly uh, where we've seen nearly half a million course completions just during this entire COVID period. Right. So, imagine twenty thousand people are the workforce, but they've by themselves completed nearly half a million courses, and that is you know fantastic. Right. So that was that was uh, the fourth learning which uh, which we wanted to share with you. Now, coming to learning number five, um, and this is about you know this is a lot to do with the role of the workforce and the way they've been supporting the organization. Uh, when we when we entered the lockdown period, a big concern which many business leaders had was that will our workforce hold true to the business promise and will they actually work during this lockdown period or will they stay away from work right and 90 percent of the business leaders who we spoke to said that you know not only are our people working but they are putting in significantly more number of uh, more number of you know hours they are showing a far greater amount of uh, accountability and there is much less absenteeism than before during this entire covid period uh, and what what uh, what uh, what really touched them deeply was the fact that um, 
a large percentage of this workforce is committed towards making sure that their businesses and their you know organizations succeed are uh, able to survive this period and they're able to come out stronger during this period of time and that was a uh, you know that was a wonderful insight which we received in this period we also saw that uh, the role of the team manager or the team leader became extremely crucial uh, in fact 72% business leaders felt that the entire uh, responsibility onus of you know employee engagement during this period of time was fundamentally uh, balanced on the ability of the team leader to really you know work with their uh, you know work uh, work with their teams um and you know drive engagement and make sure that people are staying and engaged and committed to the business process um also over this period of time what we've seen is uh the balance scorecard of you know many of these team leaders have actually started to have a greater degree of focus on our driving engagement and making sure that you know team members are doing well right so this was the fifth learning that uh, workforce has really rallied behind the organization during this uh, during this difficult period coming to our sixth learning seems to be a little bit of like english can you yeah yeah so the sixth learning for us was um, all about agility now we've all heard about the word agility being uh you know used um you know so very often right um we've seen that you know we need to be an agile organization and we need to have an agile team and so on and so forth but the real test of organizations which were truly agile was this entire lockdown period or rather is this entire lockdown period <clears throat> three big big findings came out during this period of time finding number one was 60% of business leaders felt that the traditional concept of an organization structure in itself needed to be revisited right because we've been forced to work from home we've had to adopt new ways of seeking approvals and getting work done and that has uh, that has ensured that um, people try and be as efficient as possible and that means they've been you know skipping the levels of hierarchy and directly getting approvals in place they've been working across teams without having been told to do so they've been really focused on driving a set of business outcomes and you know focusing on a set of priorities um and you know they felt that wow when we were in a traditional structure working in our offices we had to convince people to collaborate across the functions and right now we are seeing that you know happen so very naturally and therefore do we need to relook at our organization structure and say that we are better served by having a team based structure in in uh, instead of having a traditional structure so you know that was that uh, that you know came out as a revelation and if you see on the left hand side of the screen you have so many business leaders who you know spoken about similar things right the second key learning was 85% business leaders felt that uh, people themselves had become a lot more resilient and they had become a lot more agile and they were finding faster and better ways to deliver work in this particular constraint period so what do i mean earlier and let's let's take a very simple example earlier there used to be uh, you know pre covid many organizations required to have a hard uh, hard copy document and to have a signature on that document for any form of uh, approval to happen this period prevents you from doing so without approval work can't happen and therefore uh, organizations are starting to design workflows which uh, allow for electronic approval within the system itself and in the short term they are also making use of uh, making use of email based approvals uh 85% of leaders have actually started doing that and that's in stark contrast to where we were pre uh, pre covid period where we felt that this was the only way to do uh, to do something right uh now the need is to survive and you know thrive and therefore it requires us to be a lot more a uh, lot more agile and the third point which was uh, which was very interesting was 
uh, organizations that had already established remote working policies and they had already started to preempt that the country will go into a lockdown are the ones who are suffering the least during the COVID period. In fact, our survey showed that only 10% of them uh, have actually registered any form of you know, productivity drop. They've been able to manage their business operations more or less fine uh, during this period because they've been a lot more forward thinking and a lot more, you know, um, a lot more, you know, agile during this period, right? So, um, organizations in general, which have shown greater degree of um, greater degree of agility, have actually um, come out stronger during this period of time, and they are most likely going to come out, you know, significantly stronger once the lockdown ends and once they enter the recovery and the thrive uh, you know, phases of the economy. Okay. So coming to our last learning, which we picked up. And this is all about uh, the gig economy. <laughs> now, in you know public sector as well as in private sector, many times we need to call upon the use of you know specialists, people who are not uh, entirely on our roles, and therefore we contract them for a uh, limited period of time. Prior to COVID, we saw that there was an increasing trend globally that. Um, that you know organizations wanted to move from a fixed workforce to a more variable workforce or towards the gig economy because that allowed them to source skills which they did not have for a limited period of time and then you know not have to pay for it on a on, on a you know continuous basis and that as a trend has actually been picking up over the last you know five to six years in fact you know 2023 we expect uh, India's gig economy to to be approximately half a trillion dollars in size, which is which is you know a significant majority. Because of COVID nineteen, many organizations have started to relook at this plan. You have a section of uh, companies which are saying that look, um, we need to protect and preserve our full time jobs, and therefore uh, we will reduce dependence on you know. Uh, gig economy workers, and rather we would support upskilling and reskilling re of our um, um, of our talent to make sure that we are not uh, we are not dependent on the gig workers. On the uh, on the you know other side of the table, you have a set of organizations who are also viewing this as an opportunity, and are saying that look, um, <clears throat> there will be a set of people. Who will, uh, who will re enter the workforce because of this, uh, you know, because of this downturn? And here is an opportunity for us to use their skills for you know, limited periods of time, right? So that has, um, uh, you know, that has come out as a very sharp dichotomy between two very different workforce models. Having said that, I personally found the most, uh, the most interesting insight. Which has come out of this entire period is the concept of a shared uh, shared workforce model. So what do I mean as a shared workforce model? Think about it this way: You are an organization that is deeply impacted because of COVID. You have a very large workforce, none of which you can really deploy during this period of time. Now you have two options in you know front of you. Option number one: You continue to pay the cost of this workforce, and this workforce is not not you know meaningfully engaged. Option number two, uh, many many organizations will start saying, "Do we need to rationalize our workforce because we can't um, because we can't manage this cost?" And there is a third option which says that, "Look, I as an organization have a large workforce which I cannot sustain, but there is another organization which actually needs this large large workforce, but they don't have you know sufficient number of people in the market. Can I loan my workforce to this uh, to this company for a limited period of time?" And therefore, I no longer have to manage the cost. And at the same time, the other organization also is able to deliver on its own in a business promise. And that forms the concept of a shared uh, shared workforce, right? And shared workforce, which might sound theoretical, is actually being practiced in uh, you know practiced in uh, India right now as we speak. So you know what we are seeing is an emergence of three very distinct workforce models. Which are you know uh, emerging strongly in the market, right? So these 
really summarize the seven learnings which we have got in the market uh, based on our various conversations. The question therefore arises is that what might be some of the next steps or quick wins um, leaders will want to take during this period, right? So, uh, Nilesh, if you can come to the next slide. So, Mr. Mandel has asked a question, what is a gig economy? Um, sir, a gig economy is your you know, temporary workforce. Let's say um, you require someone with a very specialist uh, skill set. And uh, you know, you know that you're not going to use this skill for uh, for the uh, for the entire duration of time. You're only going to use it maybe for you know 30 days or 60 days in the entire year. And therefore, instead of uh, therefore instead of hiring someone full time, you just take on someone part time. And that you know workforce which really operates part time across a number of organizations is called the gig economy. Um, Nilesh, can you come to the next slide? I'm not able to see the quick wins. So there are a couple of interesting questions, uh, Pratik and Agar. If you want to take them right now, then we can. Uh, then yeah, we can absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Mr. Sudhir Sharma is asking that will design of virtual organizations be dramatically different from the physical organizations? And what's your point of? What's your take on uh, this point, especially from a PSU context? If you were to look at. Ankur, do you want to take this one? Uh, sorry, sorry. Can you just uh, repeat the question for me, please? So it says that will the design of virtual organizations be dramatically different from physical organizations? Mr. Sudhir Sharma wants to know the answer so to that. It could be, and uh, there are probably uh, three or four different ways to look at it. Uh, the virtual organization, uh, in some cases, may move away from the idea of functions to outcomes which means that you need some uh, smaller empowered teams working in collaboration virtually to deliver on you know on a, on, a, on an outcome as against saying that i'm going to do my functional work such as uh, you know uh, invoice processing uh, in finance uh, or you know material management in uh, in in supply chain um, so so that's one angle the other angle could also be that um, uh, certain uh, teams could be structured still in the traditional construct, which is how we are structured now. Um, the organization design question actually is going to be very important. And in that, we'll have, we're going to have to make a lot of choices that are driven by the operating model. So uh, just to make it very tangible, um, let's say, as an example, uh, if you uh, let's take an HR example. Uh, if your onboarding uh, as a process is going to be completely virtual, there is uh, the security angle. There is the uh, the uh, you know how are you going to identify the person? Uh, whether the person who is signing up for your job role is actually the person who who has applied? Uh, there's many angles to it, and for which you may need to enroll certain agencies. Uh, which did not exist in uh, in your ecosystem earlier. So the team may may, may be made up of your uh, you know on, your on role employees, certain agencies or your ecosystem, and um, you know and other functions that may not necessarily have been a part. So so to cut the long story short, it, we will see some departures from normal practice, uh, which is your functional silos, and in certain cases those would need to be maintained. Great. And in fact, Mr. Saha has a very interesting question. I'll just bring in Mr. Saha into the conversation. Mr. Saha, if you're there, I have just unmuted you. And, uh, and if you can uh, take a question to the, to the panelists. Mr. Saha, are you there? Yes, Mr. Saha, go on. Mr. Saha is from BHEL. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Saha, please. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Go, go. Uh, uh, absolutely audible. Mr. Saha, go on. We can hear you. Hello. Yes, yes, Mr. Saha, we can hear you. Please proceed. Okay, I think there's some technical challenges with him. I'll try and read out his questions. 
His question is that where do you see CPSC is vis-a-vis -vis private sector organization in times of COVID and subsequent times with respect to work from home option cable for etc. Uh, what did the ticker contrast that we imagine now and Sorry, Elish, your voice is breaking up. But if I understood the question correctly, Nilish, can you go on mute, please? Sure. Um, if I understood the question correctly, uh, uh, the big the big question is what's the difference between uh, public sector entities versus uh, private organizations, and and how how might virtual work differ? Um, to be quite honest, it's a discovery at this point of time. If anybody says that they have all the answers, they are probably um, you know, just imagining the answers. Having said that, there are a few themes that are emerging. For example, uh, public, uh, public sector entities will actually find ways to gainfully employ people, right? And so there is a an angle of uh, making sure that your workforce is gainfully employed within your organization across probably your functions and across lines of businesses. Whereas uh, the corporate sector will try to approach it from a cost angle. So that's the big difference. Uh, the other big difference that we, we are already starting to see, uh, and it's an emerging trend, so don't quote me on this uh, broadly, but uh, there will be an impact uh, on real estate. So uh, whereas PSCs may not necessarily carry large overheads uh, in terms of um, you know physical space, corporates carry a la large overhead in, in terms of uh, physical space, right? So there will be a departure from, uh, you know, holding large, uh, expensive corporate real estate uh, to actually, uh, you know, a disaggregated mechanism of using space if and when necessary. So those are the two big things that I, I, I foresee. Um, corporates will probably uh, uh, adopt the idea of a shared workforce much faster because of the the fact that they may not necessarily be shackled by a lot of regulations. Uh, whereas PSCs will, will still need to actually follow all the guidelines that have been laid down by the government, perhaps change those and, you know, help the government reform, bring, bring in reforms. But that's a slightly longer process, whereas corporates would be able to move more in a more agile manner. Lovely, Angur. I'm bringing in Mr. Praveen Kumar from HPCL to, to put up his question. He also has a very interesting question to to ask. Mr. Praveen Kumar? Uh, am I audible now? Yes, you are. Hello. Yes, you are. Please go ahead. How do we, uh, yeah. How do we, what should we do that our engagement level and the productivity level remains high if we have to implement this work from home policy in the future? Thank you for if I, I think I'll take this question and then uh, perhaps hand it over to you. Nilesh, you to put yourself on mute. Um, uh, thank you. Um, so thank you for asking this question. This is a very interesting one uh, and actually very pertinent because engagement is going to be challenging uh, in uh, especially given the fact that now you cannot really get people together in a in a room and and you know give them a pep talk as an example uh, there are many other things that will come into play for example uh, there will be certain workforce segments that you have that will be very comfortable with the fact that they are working virtually and they're interacting with their leaders and their teams virtually and you know uh, it's um, all is uh, everything is driven by communication on communication tools and social collaboration tools uh, which is usually your, you know, millennial or post-millennial generation that will be very, very comfortable with that. Whereas um, some of us, uh, such as myself, who are, you know, on the cusp of baby boomers versus uh, uh, Gen X, um, will will face challenges in adopting new technology. So it's a two-pronged uh, approach that organizations are going to have to take. One is how do you create uh, two things? One is resilience within the leadership um, and the second is uh, the comfort with the new ways of working so the leadership will play a critical role as usual in in employee engagement however they themselves need to be engaged in the in the new ways of working 
right? And so it becomes a dual responsibility for the management to shape that and to make that happen. On the other hand, uh, for employees, uh, there, there will need to be added communication, added uh, change management programs that enable them to understand that you know the way the new ways of working are only going to enhance their career options and career choices and how might they navigate such a such a, uh, such a situation uh, what might they do differently um, and 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 interestingly enough as we are starting to work with many of our clients we are observing that some of these solutions are very bespoke because the you know the values and behaviors and the culture of each organization is different sometimes there are differences uh, maybe even there are microcultures within certain um, you know, functions or departments and teams, and you need to address engagement uh, slightly differently in those uh, cases as well. All in all, in all uh, that is to say that, yes, engagement is going to be important, and it will hinge a lot on making sure that the leadership actually understands how to engage people in this new world, where you, you know, you, uh, and I'll give you a few examples of what we are doing in just a little bit. Uh, so how do you engage people in this new world? How do you actually uh, make it uh, contextual to the workforce segments based on whatever classification it is, right? Type of workforce, um, the age group or generation uh, that they belong to, and so on and so forth. So that's one pillar. The second is also um, how do you educate people on making the right choices while while working virtually? Um, there's there's the wellness angle, there is the mental health angle. There's also the you know the the fact that you are not in office and you are not really collaborating. With people face to face and there is a an element of isolation so you need to address all of that uh, what we are doing and i'll give you a few examples simple things these are things that our teams have started uh, but um, we have a friday night happy hour uh, within my practice right and and this friday night happy hour is for uh, different team members to come up with different ways to um, to interact with each other so the the last week we had a we had a quiz round. This quiz round was actually nothing to do with work. It was uh, to do with um, uh, with entertainment programs, and uh, you know uh, it. What? You know, tell them. Presentation. Make. 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 So we will take one last question before we move on to our presentation. I'll try and bring in Mr. Santanu Roy. Mr. Santanu Roy, you're going up next. Okay. Mr. Santanu, please ask your question. Mr. Santanu is from Gale. Gas Hello. Uh, good afternoon. I would like uh, the following issues to be addressed if possible. Uh, my more than three and a half decades of work, I have seen one of the things that really stall PSE working is a fascination for paperwork and digital and signature. So in this day, it will be, it will be nice if we can have the digital signature and e-note sheet. In fact, in government of India, several departments are doing wonderful work. That can be given equal weightage and definitely do away with the physical signatures and papers. And one more thing is the standardization of softwares. Well, uh, we need to work collaboration a lot in our company. We do a lot of collaboration, including DHL, CL, every uh, many other organizations. This standardization of software is possibly something that is required for the VC and the collaborative platforms and SOP. Which, uh, in most companies, we develop SOP. So if this can be highlighted, thank you, Mr. Roy. I think you know beautiful points that you've put out there. Uh, I think the first one was regarding paperwork. And if you look at the slide which is there on the screen, it's actually point number one, which is the design of work itself. Uh, after after this entire lockdown period ends, we very strongly believe that many organizations and not just public sector, but public as well as private sector organizations are going to relook at the way work itself is done. And, and you know, how does the flow of work actually happen, right? So is there really a need for six to seven levels of approvals as we move from point A to point B to point C? Or can it be much more faster? And our prediction is that one of the first things which will get impacted is this part around you know the flow of work and you know things like uh, uh, you know physical approvals and moving them to e-signatures and and uh, and you know so on. The second part which you mentioned was around the uh, Nilesh. Can you uh, can you mute yourself if you don't mind? Uh, 
The second part was around, um, you know, the whole thing around uh, standardization of softwares. Um, if if uh, if you see my, uh, uh, you know, if you have seen a few slides ago, we had actually showed you a graph. While it is not uh, intentional, but what is happening overall from an industry perspective is organizations are gravitating towards three, three to maximum of four types of co uh, collaboration tools. Those being Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Skype, and you know, WebEx. The remaining tools, while still important, I'm sure in some some you know, way and form, they to uh, they to some extent are getting sidelined, uh, and and we're going to see this trend going going uh, going forward as well, right? We're going to see this degree of consolidation and standardization across the types of tools people are using, because um, most companies want tools which enables them to you know, communicate and connect and collaborate seam seamlessly, not only within their own organization, but also across the organizations, right? So I think that is also a growing uh, growing trend. Um, and your third uh, part was, Anilesh, if you could just remind me what was the third part that Sir had said. You, you're on mute, Anilesh. Yes, yeah, so I'll just try and bring him bring him uh, back. Meanwhile, Mr. Sokti had a question. Mr. Sokti, oh, great. Uh, yeah, Ankur and Pratik, uh, I have directly got two three questions uh, from the participants. Of course, uh, Ankur had touched about the productivity, but the direct question which is being asked by the participants, especially in the CPSC, uh, uh, I, I think way of working. How to measure the productivity and the performance? I think it's one of the most important question, which is in the uppermost uh, mind, of most of the participants uh, in the public sector enterprise. And second point, they are saying that uh, because of all this changing way of working, what are the skill sets uh, which would be required for the workforce? These are the two points uh, which need to be addressed. Yes. So thank you, Mr. Sokti, for you know. Uh, raising those questions. Let me answer the first one. How do we measure performance in this environment, right? Traditionally, if you go to see in, in when you know, when you know, all of us used to work in a physical environment, um, the amount of, the amount of you know, displayed work or, you know, for the lack of a better word, how much, uh, how much effort you're putting in and how long you're in office and, um, you know, things like that used to matter. As we move towards a much more remote way of working, uh, we envisage that organizations are going to shift from monitoring activities and tasks to actually measuring outcomes and saying that, look, it's, it's completely up to you as an individual how you would like to manage your work day. What we expect from you as an employee is that we expect certain types of you know, broad outcomes. Now, you may choose to achieve these outcomes depending on your choice of work hours. You may choose to achieve these outcomes in six hours or in you know, 12 hours. But this is what we have as an expectation from you in your role. So uh, fundamentally, we see that, that you know, sort of a shift actually coming into play over a period of time. Um, the second part, Mr. Sokti, which you asked regarding the skills, and I think as you know, Ankur had uh, aptly put it, it is a period of discovery at this stage. Having, you know, having said that, uh, many organizations are starting to invest heavily in you know, digital skills, uh, and not only for certain specific roles, but trying to build uh, fluency around technology and digital across roles, across your know, management levels. Um, one of the things which we as Deloitte very regularly see our clients ask us is, can you help our organization build a much more digital uh, friendly mindset? Can you, can, can you, uh, can you help by you know, uh, building a culture of digital? Um, can you, um, um, you know, really, uh, really talk to us about things around cloud and blockchain and various other digital technologies? So, a strong focus going forward from a skills perspective is definitely going to be towards digital and uh, digitization as well as you know technology right uh, i uh, mr sophia uh, 
I hope I've been able to answer those uh, those two questions. No, it's okay. These are the questions that referred to me by our apartments. Very can well uh, responded. Can I just add a couple a couple additional points? Um, there is a mindset change that you need to start start to address as well. So, digital skills, yes. There is also what we call the digital mindset, which is because there is so much unknown as we start working virtually even today we don't know what our problems we are going to face because they're not everything is, is being done um, in the traditional way right? and as we as we start to work more and more um, we will discover that some solutions need to be created and those solutions cannot be traditional again right those need to be digital and hence building a digital mindset leadership through to the lowest level in the organization is going to be important just a limited point but uh, I thought I thought it would be important for our discussion. Uh, okay. Just just I have just now got another question from some uh, multiple question on the gig economy. Although you have already uh, uh, explained that they say that how this can be adopted by the CPSCs and the risk of confidentiality associated with them. How this is being being taken care by uh, private sector etc. Because the public sector is normally used to have the permanent jobs. But in the gig economy, how this can be adopted by CPSs? Any right. ideas? Yeah. So, so it, it is not. It's a it's a difficult question, uh, sir, because of the fact that you are also limited by the government uh, guidelines on this. Um, part of the uh, part of uh, the responsibility of the PSCs is, is going to be reforms, which is how do you enable uh, such work conditions in, and you can you formulate policies to be able to enable that. Uh, working with the government, um, the the way private sector is doing this is uh, is actually they use the same principles of uh, employees, but they actually hold the uh, the uh, gig workforce in uh, in basically a separate compartment, if you will, in their system. So they would create an employee ID, they would create everything, they would have an onboarding and an offboarding process, they would have limited access to certain systems that are necessary for them to perform their job role. They would have um, the same sort of background checks in all of uh, the governance that they would have for employees as well. Uh, it's just that uh, the uh, the headcount is not counted in your traditional headcount. So there is a uh, there's a significant amount of process work that is needed for you to make that happen as well. It, it is not straightforward. Uh, you need to be able to say, hey, uh, very quickly identify who is uh, a contractor versus who is a a permanent employee are you uh, do you have policies defined for those how does how do, how do rewards work in that case so there's a lot of work that is involved uh, but once you get that done it's very easy perfect i think we can move with the deck forward and then take up the second round of questions after maybe around after 10 minutes once we close the presentation sure thank you for that Dilesh. so i think uh, what you know, one of the uh, um, in this period of time, what we're seeing is uh, there are certain quick wins. Leaders are going to look look forward to both during the COVID period as well as post this period, based on some of the learnings which they've gone through, right? And these these you know quick wins are divided into three clusters, which is work, workforce, and the workplace. From a work perspective, uh, as I had mentioned earlier. We anticipate that the design of the workflow itself is going to simplify quite a bit. People are going to start asking the question, do we need so many levels of approvals? Do we need so do we need to jump through so many hoops? Or can the flow of work itself be simplified? The second question people will ask is uh, are there uh, are there opportunities for us to you know automate some of the work which is happening, right? Uh, can we use new age technologies like machine learning, cognitive, uh, robotic process automation, and so on, to really get done away with you know transactional processes, so that our uh, our employees can focus on more you know complex level problem solving. Uh, and the third thing which will happen on the work front is there'll be a simplification of overall process itself. Um, as you know, many of us are aware. Um, the process flow around work in itself is fairly tedious at times. So are there process flow optimization opportunities as well? And I think there are, and I think leaders are really going to look look, uh, look to them. On the workforce front, uh, again, I think three, uh, three things will happen. 
one is new newer models of employment will really you know, kick in. Uh, of course, we have the full-time employee model and we have the gig economy model currently. But there is a very real chance we are going to see that whole shared employment model also you know, flow in soon. The second part is there will be a significantly greater focus on skill uh, on your skill development. Um, in this period of time, you know, there is uh, if uh, if there is one solid trend which can be observed is is that the uptake of learning has significantly increased over the last four to five weeks. As I mentioned earlier, it's actually increased by 300%. The third thing which is going to happen with the workforce is they are going to be more resilient and more tolerant towards receiving shocks like this going forward. I think emotionally, our workforce is going to come out significantly stronger from this experience and they will have a greater degree of resilience. This will, this will be called out as one of those stories which can be compared to the depression, and which is back in 1929. And, and you know, uh, I think people will come out a lot more stronger from this. And finally, from a work workplace perspective, um, one thing which people are going to revisit the day lockdown opens is on business continuity and how can we plan better for it. Um, a lot of organizations have business continuity plans, but through our conversations with leaders, we also realize that many of those plans were collecting dust until this you know, entire COVID, uh, COVID situation happened. And when they actually open those, you know, continuity manuals, they realize that, hey, actually, it's not there as much. Uh, of course, there will be things around uh, uh, employee engagement and touch points and so on, which will also happen at this point in time, right? Now, if you look at this from an overall perspective, and, you know, if you were to bring it all together and we say that, yes, we are in a response phase right now, but how are we going, you know, what are the 10 things which are really going to change going forward? So the 10 things are there in front of you. Uh, A, we will see business models uh, evolving. Two, we will see uh, automation and robotics take a significantly more center stage. Three, uh, the, the traditional concept of uh, employee engagement is going to shift and they're going to go in more towards employee experience creation. Four, there's going to be a stronger focus on skill building, right? Uh, and primarily around digital skills. Uh, fifth one is going to be on the alternative workforce model. Sixth is investing in IT infrastructure. Um, if the, the one thing this particular crisis has showed, uh, showed most organizations is they are, uh, is their IT infrastructure is woefully un, un, unprepared to face these, uh, these sort of, you know, shocks. So there will be a strong focus on this. Sixth, we're going to see, um, you know, a well-defined framework of work from home being you know, put in place, not only in the private sector, but also very much in the public sector. Uh, seventh, uh, or rather eighth, is the entire concept around network-based teams. So the traditional concept of organization structures is most certainly going to be impacted. Uh, and we will see more and more organizations adopt team-based structures which are focused on delivering certain set of you know, uh, outcomes. The ninth one being uh, infrastructure investment will be optimized. And this is purely around costs, uh, which are this is purely around overhead costs, right? So uh, as our colleagues within the, uh, within the HR fraternity will well know that apart from the fixed salary cost of an employee, there is a cost associated with real estate, with IT, with electricity, with rent, and so on and so on and so forth. We anticipate that this entire infrastructure cost will significantly reduce over a period of time. In fact, the underlying reason why TCS is looking towards making this migration or you know, my shift towards uh, large scale work, work from home in the next five years is to significantly lower their direct overhead cost. And the final one is a new form of culture is really going to evolve in the workplace, right? And this culture is going to be more digitally driven, and it's going to be more, more you know, collaboration and teaming driven, and more focused on engagement. And it's going to be not restricted to a, a particular office location or a function, but I think it's going to, uh, but I think it's going to be, you know, pervasive, and it's going to be across um, um, across functions and you know, uh, you know, departments. 
So, so you know, these were some of our thoughts around the future of work and you know how it's getting accelerated due to the COVID uh, due to the COVID crisis. Uh, obviously, this is uh, this is not a you know uh, this is not a easy time for uh, for you know, most employees. Having said that, I think organizations and employees are doing a fantastic job dealing with this entire crisis. So, uh, you know, that's that's how we would uh, you know like to end this particular conversation, right? So, are there any additional questions which we can answer? Yeah. Maybe I, back to you. Yeah. Hi, Priti. Thanks a lot for a very very uh, uh, informative presentation. And uh, your effort to answer all possible questions is highly appreciated. Same with you, Akur. Uh, Nilesh, can we switch off the presentation, please? Yeah, thank you. So, yes, we have a couple of questions more. Uh, one which I would like to take up is uh, by Ms. Priyanka, which is a very focused HR question, which says, how will the role of HR really change? and how they should adopt a business continuity model. And she's asked specifically the three key focus areas from HR perspective in the current new normal scenario that uh, an uh, HR person should look at. So Pratik and Ankur, uh, would you like to answer the same please? Yeah, and, and I think Priyanka has also asked uh, another question on the QA about uh, creating a compelling employee experience. So I'll take both. Uh, so here's the role, evolving role of HR as, uh, as we see it. This is not just related to COVID, but COVID actually amplifies that role um, quite a bit, which is that, uh, to, look, I mean, um, HR has been talking about having a seat at the table for a long time. Uh, this, is, this is actually going to go beyond having a seat at the table and actually helping the business make the right decisions because uh, the we, we already talked about future of work. Future of work choices are no longer going to be only based on uh, on business priorities. It's actually also going to be based on how do you position people in appropriate roles in the context of the business. So business will not be unilaterally able to, uh, to shape that uh, and, uh, and HR will also not be able to unilaterally shape that. So it needs to be a collaborative effort lot more than it used to be uh, just to give it a little more meaning where there is disruption that disruption needs uh, the angle of uh, both you know what uh, what human resource requirements are, are needed what compliance requirements are, are you going to weave into the decision making and then how are you going to actually make it happen with people again uh, is is a is going to be the heavy involvement of hr which then extends to we already started talking about the network of teams team-based organization structure, that's where HR is going to have a critical role um, uh, in, in desi re re designing and redesigning. By the way, it's not a, a limited activity in that you design the organization and you roll it out and it's done with a shelf life of 10 years. No, it is, uh, it is going to be a continuous evolution going forward. And that's where HR is going to have a critical role. So uh, it, on one hand, it's about shaping the business thinking or collaborating with business on the other hand, it's about continuous organization design. And then the third part, uh, which uh, Priyanka, you asked about, is uh, about engaging employees. And, and uh, the, you have to create new ways of, uh, of engaging employees in the new construct. And, and in many cases, we are envisioning it to be bespoke, which is based on, let's say, how you have designed your teams. You would determine how you would be able to engage them by applying design thinking, by first asking them what is it that is going to, uh, what they need to succeed in their job roles, to be able to nurture their ambitions and grow within the organization and so on and so forth. Uh, the, the new angle or the angle that is going to be amplified even further is wellness. Um, virtual work environments will cause different types of issues that we did not face in face-to-face -face environments. And, and you're going to have to look at men, mental and physical health a lot more than, uh, than, than you have been seeing. So uh, all those three components, in, in our opinion, are going to be important. And there's, there's many layers of information to this. And if you are interested, connect with us offline. We are able to have, uh, you know, we'll be happy to share additional information on this. Thank you, Ankur. We have a similar question by Mr. Kulbi Lamba. Uh, Nilesh, I think we are patching him in. 
Nilesh? Unmute yourself and uh, and raise your question. We'll be happy to answer. Hello. Am I audible? Yeah. Yeah, yeah Mr. Lamba, you're audible. Yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, my question is, uh, what will be the impact on total HR workforce and VJ total workforce of the company? How that ratio will change? And the second factor is, what will be the key motivation factors for the employees in this work environment? Sorry, uh, could you repeat the first part of the question? Which uh, which workforce are you? HR, HR to overall employee ratio. Does oh, that change okay. post COVID? Does that change? You know, that's a, an interesting question. Um, I don't know that there is a straight answer to that uh, because the HR to employee ratio has um, has gone up or gone down based on what a, a employee, uh, you know, and talent management processes organizations have adopted. Uh, in the erstwhile days, you would say, you know, if you're an IT organization or ITES organization, uh, you, one is to 600 or one is to 800 is actually a, a great ratio. That was based on an assumption that all processes and systems and uh, governance and controls is common. Right now, in today's world, it is so complicated. Uh, you, each organization has different digital programs. You have different platforms. You have uh, different processes. Uh, there are workforce segments that have different needs. So the uh, the answer to that question is not straightforward. In our in our um, in our experience and whatever we have done so far, we don't really see the ratio changing as much as what you do. So what you do will change significantly as against how many people are engaged in doing the typical, what you might call HR activities. Um, and then the second question uh, was about how do you engage people, right? Um, that, that I covered, right? So you're going to have to uh, determine what is it that will be uh, help people engage. Um, I covered this uh, previously as well that you're going to have to actually uh, engage your leadership first in understanding what it takes to engage people, and then get them engaged in engaging people. Right? And so, um, so it's uh, it's not a straightforward journey. Um, there's two angles again to leadership. Just to repeat what I said, uh, one is how do you create resilience because leadership is going to have to demonstrate different skills to get through the situation currently. The second is how do you start to engage people in this new construct where people are not going to be there in front of you. You cannot put them all in one room and um, and talk to them about your vision and mission. Uh, you can't address issues uh, real time sitting in front of them. So now you're going to have to devise new methods of engagement and those are going to be different by workforce segments and, and your leadership is going to have to be agile to be able to do that. So starts with a leadership journey and then with people, it's actually about educating them on how to navigate this environment, how to actually, um, you know, get what they need, both from the leadership, from a policy standpoint, from a, a process standpoint um, for, for solving their issues and, and getting engaged. Thank you, Mr. Lamba. Go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Lamba. Uh, we have two more questions, uh, Ankur and Kriti. Uh, uh, multiple questions on how do you see the layoff scenario? Do you think automation and increased work from home would lead to layoffs? And how do you think PSEs can deal with this? And second question is with respect to manufacturing industry. As to with you know situations like uh, industries like manufacturing, uh, production, and uh, defense in particular, where confidentiality is very high, then how do you see uh, virtual office spaces working in such industries? So I'll take the the first um, the first question. Um, look, uh, there is no there is no straight answer. Actually, I'll take your second question first. Uh, there are certain sectors. There are certain types of uh, organizations where you will need people to work from to be co-located right? and there is no getting around that at all you, you're gonna have to deal with that um, uh, now are there certain components of your work that can be done virtually yes right and so those are the the choices now for for such organizations as well the uh, the way to approach it in our in our opinion is to ask the question why not virtually 
right? So what prevents you from doing what you do virtually? What are the limitations to that? Is it regulations? Is it confidentiality or privacy? Uh, is there a security issue there? Whatever those are, and you, you can actually, if you start to deconstruct activities, then you will be able to determine, you know, that there are certain workforce segments that still can continue to work virtually. You can say with conviction today, irrespective of whether, uh, you know, you are, a, uh, you know, let's say an oil and gas organization or a power and utilities organization or, a, um, you know, a banking and financial services organization, uh, certain administrative mid office and back office job roles can definitely move to a virtual environment. So there's segmentation there. Right? The second question, uh, actually, the first question, which is the interesting one. Um, look, I'll express my point of view. Okay, and this is my point of view, so don't don't attach it to any organization as such. But if you look at the industrial revolutions, um, each industrial revolution has automated something. So whether it was the automotive revolution that happened back in the you know 60s, 50s, 60s, or uh, whether you look at what happened in the 90s, uh, there has been a significant amount of automation that was brought in. And all, all through these uh, revolutions, uh, there was a fear that it would remove jobs. Was there an impact on jobs? Yes, there was an impact on job, jobs, but it was short term. Uh, in the long term, all industrial revolutions have so far proven to have created many, many more job roles than they took away. Now, the, the key learning here is that they took away job roles, but they created new job roles. Those did not exist. The, uh, the industrial revolution 4.0 as it's being called now uh, or industry 4.0 uh, or future of work with automation coming in uh, the same situation will be amplified and let me make it real this is again my point of view the the mediocrity in job roles is going to go away it is not that job the jobs themselves will become less it is actually about procedural and mediocre skills that will be in lesser demand, which means that all of us would need to continuously upskill ourselves and learn new things to be able to uh, be relevant in the marketplace and to also, uh, you know, keep the industry going because otherwise there will be a job role shortage as well. I mean, sorry, the workforce shortage as well. So to sum it up, I, I personally don't think that in the long run there is going to be any impact. In fact, it will create more jobs. Uh, is there a short-term impact? There has always been a short-term impact and we will have to get through that. That is a beautiful one. Yeah, thanks a lot. Ankur, no straight answers for a complex question like this. Sometimes we have to learn from our experiences. One a very interesting question that I would like uh, Mr. Sunil Kumar, Director uh, HR and EB MTNL to actually pitch on, on this one. Sir, uh, there is a question regarding how do you think the MU, MOU parameters, the Memorandum of Understanding parameters with different ministries will change if we actually look at the situation of increasing virtual office spaces? Sir, over to you. And sir, after, uh, after that, uh, Ankur and uh, Pratik, I would like you to pitch on this if you have any comments. Over to you, sir. Uh, good evening. The MOU parameters, if you see, which we signed with the department, it is 50% is on the general parameters, how the company will grow, how will, what will be the turnover, what will be the financial ratios are there. That is not going to change. That 50% parameter will remain the same. The rest 50% parameters where the other physical activities of the companies are there, there are some more things on the virtual organizations will start coming in. But a lot of things in PSC will depend, as uh, told by the experts, will depend upon the DPE guidelines. Because we all follow the, what is the guideline being followed. So in virtual offices also, I think in the coming time, some of the guidelines will start coming in. And based on that, uh, the whole PSCs will be operating and then those things will also be incorporated in the PSUs. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ankur and Pratik, do you have something to add to this? Uh, no, no, nothing from from me. Pratik, did you have anything? No, I uh, nothing from me either on this question. So 
I believe uh, MOU parameters are going to be um, as challenging as they are currently. Uh, there would be negotiations and we'll definitely see it uh, in a different way. Uh, but hopefully this uh, turns out to be a, a positive impact on overall PSEs. So, uh, Nilesh, uh, some more questions that you would like to take up? Absolutely. This is a curve uh, curveball that is coming to you towards you panelists. And uh, so, please, sir, and Sunil, sir, I think uh, you guys will also have a fair share to add to this. It basically says that we talked about virtualization. We talked about uh, how great an impact it can cause and how does work transform and so on and so forth. But CPICs typically are known to have uh, have had large infrastructures that they that they keep with us. Now, what happens if all of this goes virtual? What will happen to those workspaces? Okay, sir. Okay, yes, uh, there will de that's going to be challenging not only for the public sector, but for the private sector also. Definitely, uh, the other day when was uh, I was hearing a debate where the point was coming when the people will start working from home that uh, uh, CFOs definitely they will ask the question that whether these facilities are required or not. That alternate use of those facilities will have to be thought of. Take example of PCS, which has already around the 75% of the workforce would be working from home from 2025. There, in fact, uh, uh, CEO was in one of the uh, debate, he mentioned this thing, that uh, definitely the whatever infrastructure facility we are going to have, we are going to curtail it down and we are going to optimize it. I am sure that same thing will happen in case of the public sector undertakings also. And uh, I think uh, Sunil uh, can add to this. Uh, this this problem we are facing just recently, we have given the VRS of around 15,000 employees in the in MTNL. So and we it, were around 19,000 and now after going of this 15,000 from 31st of January, we are only 4,000. And with that, we are managing the whole show. So a so lot of spaces are getting back in because of this thing. And then because of technological changes also, lot of things are getting back in. So, so real estate, if you see in the case of MTNL, already around uh, more than 10 lakh square feet, we have put on the website that this is available for the rent. So, so lot of things will be getting back in. And as we move on to the virtualization and moving from the work to home, work from home, lot of more things will be happening on this front. But in the long run, in the long run, Sunil Sab, you agree that it will be good if more and more infrastructure is available for alternate use. And I am sure that this country is going to grow multifold. I mean, a lot of opportunities are going to come to India in form of the make in, make in India because many of the investments are going to, all of us are hoping, will get moved towards the towards India itself. Then definitely these infrastructure works are available with public sectors. That will be utilized. Absolutely. Absolutely. This, in the CGO building where I am staying, uh, the two floors have been taken by the NCLT. The NCLT court has come here. The, in Janpath, we have just vacated and given the 10 story building to Mosby. The whole Mosby office is moving from Sardar Patel Bhavan to this Janpath to power building. Due to this lockdown, it is delayed by a month or two. But it is going. We have given the 10 floor, 8 floor building in the KL one. So, so our lot of these infrastructures is going to be used for the other purposes also. Absolutely. It's amazing. And these investments can now start making money for you possibly. This one is towards Prati, you and Ankur, you to talk about what are those alternate forms of performance management which can be which can be used while having a virtual workforce and what are the things that one needs to cover if you've not already answered that? So I think we, you know, we did actually touch upon that briefly in a list, but, you know, happy to uh, expand on that a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. There are actually quite a few different types of performance management systems which are there. Uh, and I think fundamentally, a lot of organizations have started moving away from the bell curve based concept and started saying that, look, uh, if you have given employees a target at the start of the year and they've actually achieved that you know, target, um, why is it that we are trying to push them on a bell curve? Uh, were the targets not set correctly to begin with, right? So, you know, 
I think this answer has two parts really, and part one being uh, there is definitely a breakaway uh, at a you know, global level from the entire concept of you know, bell curves per se. Now, in terms of the performance management systems which are going to come into play uh, because of this way of virtual working, we think that there's going to be a very strong focus on uh, outcomes-based management. Visa, we let's say, you know, uh, monitoring at an activity or at a task level, which let's say traditional managers continue to do even uh, even in today. And and you know, let's be fair. I mean, we are all uh, we are all guilty to that uh, guilty to that particular crime where we are saying that let's let you know see see our team members and colleagues and subordinates actually working for us to believe that they are working, and and um, because of remote working. Primarily, one of the fundamental ways people will be uh, managed and you know rewarded going forward is going to be on their ability to deliver business outcomes. Um, we have already started seeing a number of organizations move towards this of performance management system, and we only expect that this uh, shift is going to grow over a period of time. So if I can add to that, um, you know, the 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 concept is. You know, there is a there is a big question mark on whether you should measure people on a performance period of one year. Meaning, do your business outcomes actually get delivered in one year? Yes, your fiscal outcomes get delivered in one year, but there are many things that don't necessarily need to tie to a one year time period. And so, taking from some of the new age organizations, even traditional organizations uh, that are into manufacturing, have ad adopted the concept of uh, OKRs. If you are aware of that, objectives and key results. Uh, which enables you to measure a lot more in real time and then attach rewards to it. Um, if you're interested, you can take a look at uh, two platforms that enable this. It's platforms, there are many, uh, but two platforms specifically, BetterWorks, betterworks.com and uh, workboard.com. Yeah, just check these two platforms out. Uh, you might find some answer, interesting answers there. Sure. And uh, so, Pisar, how, ma how many questions more should we take or should we now head towards facilitatory? We should wrap up. You're on mute. Are you on mute, sir? Sorry. We're already on four, uh, 445. Correct. I think uh, now it's time to I mean, sure. close the discussions. Sure. Somebody to you. Yeah. Thank you, Nilesh. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, participants, for such interesting questions. And uh, though the questions are still pouring in, we have 144 questions of which we've tried to answer most of them. Uh, but still, if you are looking for any long term solutions or if you're looking for something, uh, some, some specific issue that you would like to be addressed, you can always write to school. And we'd be more than happy to take up and guide uh, and help you resolve uh, with uh, whatever department, ministry, or consultant uh, uh, best wish in your case. And uh, before uh, we actually formally end the session, what a good session would be without a very classic wrap up with by a very experienced professional like Mr. Sunil Kumar himself, who is director HRED in of, of one of the leading telecom industries of the world, uh, MTNL, and uh, is currently going through a very transitional phase. And uh, so, sir, we would like to hear from you on the webinar and on this particular topic of future of work. Over to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I, I must congratulate the Atul Swapti ji on the scope and the whole Deloitte team who has conducted this seminar, this webinar so successfully. More than 500 participants. And I have attended such webinar for the first time. And so much of interactions clearly shows how much relevant this webinar was. During this lockdown period, uh, telecom being the essential services, and in MTNL, we had a very tough time. The whole government, the courts started working digitally many times from the home. So that puts a very additional challenge to MTNL. We had to maintain a very delicate balance between the lockdown the social distancing, and at the same time, maintaining the services. We strongly feel that the new norms in these scenarios need to be developed, and DP must be looking after in these two things. We found that the employees and the in-home also people are not 
ready for these things. So from MTNL side, we doubled the data capacity because there were a lot of consumption in the in their home. We facilitated the VPN also from the home securely, but many of them would not be able to use it properly. One thing is certain that this COVID is going to change the life very much. The whole work, workplace, as well as the workforce will need to be adapted to meet this challenge. The sooner we do, much better it will be. I feel that the coming time will not be for the survival of the fittest, but it will be survival for the quickest. Whosoever adopted first fastly, that will be much better. We must accept that now onwards, the world has changed forever. Adaptation to the new world will be key to the success. Digital collaboration will be the new mantra. I will request Swapti Ji to keep on organizing such webinars for the benefit of one and all. Once again, thank you very much to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. And very valid point mentioned, sir, the FIFO system will change to FIFS. First in, first survives. So quicker we adopt, quicker we survive. So, sir, with this, we uh, technically come to the end of the webinar. But before we sign off, we actually want to apologize that uh, we were not expecting such an overwhelming response of close to 700 active participants. 500 were able to join, 508 to be specific. And we received more than 200 queries with respect to not being able to join because uh, Zoom uh, restricts the entry to 508. So uh, apologies from our side with respect to that. But looking at the uh, response that we have received, we assure you that we would uh, discuss with Deloitte and we would uh, try and organize a similar uh, webinar in the near future. And uh, hopefully then we will, we will be able to take in more participants. And uh, uh, with this, uh, another point that I would like to mention is that no webinar is perfect. Every webinar has a scope of improvement uh, besides internet connectivity. So uh, we have emailed uh, and we have WhatsApp uh, a Google form to you, which is a response feedback for our webinars. Please help us improve through uh, by filling that. It's a, hardly a one second job. It's a quick link. So please do that participants. Your response and your feedback would help us to make this even better. And uh, with this, I Samriti Jain with Nilesh sign off officially from this, formally from this, and looking forward to all with, to meet all of you again in the next webinar. Thank you again, panelists, for your wonderful input. And a special thanks to Sunil sir for actually sharing his experience with us and sharing his expertise with us. To Sopti sir for always motiv motivating us and leading us from the front. And with the zeal and enthusiasm, we'll definitely do more. And thanks, Nilesh, for being such a wonderful co-host. With this, I am Priti Jain signing off officially from here. Thanks a lot, participants, and we meet again. Please don't forget to fill in the feedback form. Yes, Prateek, you want to say something? Thank you all very much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Sopti. Thank you, Mr. Kumar. Thank you, audience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.